Hello, my name is John Blundell. I'm the Director General and Ralph Harris Fellow at the Institute of Economic Affairs. I'm also the author of Waging the War of Ideas, which uh, went from this first edition to a second edition and is now in a third revised and expanded edition. It's downloadable at the IEA's website. This book is really a collection of my essays over the last 15 to 20 years, all dealing with the history of free market oriented think tanks on both sides of the Atlantic. It's quite a remarkable story. It starts in the spring of 1944 when F.A. Hayek published The Road to Serfdom. It was a uh, dire warning against uh, central planning and it was a huge bestseller. It tapped a nerve after the austerity and controls of World War II. It was so successful as a book between the spring of 44 and uh, the winter of 45 that in the spring of 1945 Reader's Digest um, brought out a condensed version of the book and for the first and only time in the history of the Reader's Digest the condensed book was put at the front of the magazine as you can see here under the headline one of the most important books of our generation and to this day the IEA uh, reprints uh, that condensed version uh, here it is, uh, along with another essay by Hayek of that time that's quite relevant called The Intellectuals and Socialism. We even have the cartoon version uh, that was published in the United States. And uh, again, this is downloadable at the IEA's website. The story starts uh, af after uh, the Reader's Digest uh, condensed version uh, appeared. Uh, a young Royal Air Force officer who was working in Whitehall at the Ministry of Defence and was a Reader's Digest uh, junkie, uh, went to the LSC to visit with Hayek, and he went, walked into Hayek's office uh, unannounced, and he said, Professor Hayek, I've read the condensed version of Road to Serfdom in Reader's Digest, I'm going to go into politics, and I'm going to put it all right. And Hayek said, no you're not. He said, society's course will be changed only by changing ideas, and to, to change ideas, first you must reach the intellectuals with reasoned argument, and their influence will prevail and the politicians will follow. Well, this wasn't exactly a blueprint for action. And for ten years, uh, Fisher uh, tried various things, farming uh, and so on. And in the uh, summer of 1955, however, uh, under the name of the Institute of Economic Affairs and styling himself as director, he published a little book by George Winder called Toward the Free Convertibility of Sterling. It was a call for the abolition of exchange controls. It took off. It hit a nerve. People were sick and tired of exchange controls, and thousands of copies were sold. It was extraordinarily well-reviewed well in America, uh, where the publication of this book was very much seen as uh, Britain perhaps uh, returning to economic sanity. The sales were so strong that uh, Fisher felt uh, emboldened, and he approached a young economist at St. Andrews University called Ralph Harris, who he'd heard speak a few years earlier and who he knew shared his concerns about uh, the problems of planning and central control and, and the need to re-establish a market economy and the importance of property rights and the rule of law. And he enticed Harris to London for lunch in the summer of 56 and with the promise of a thousand pounds a year he got Harris to move. Uh, the first IEA office was so small um, that when people came to visit Ralph they had to sit in the corridor outside uh, and talk to him uh, th through the door. Uh, he soon hooked up with uh, Dr. Arthur Selden, um, who became the Institute's editorial director, and together they began the barrage of uh, monographs on many, many topics, which by the mid-70s and certainly by the 80s have been credited with changing British economic opinion away from central planning and toward a more market-oriented vision. What were the big issues when you first dropped by the IEA in the 1970s? It's funny to think back now, uh, of course, back then inflation was a huge issue and I remember the month when inflation nearly hit 30%. It's very hard to remember those days uh, now uh, when we have 2 3%. In, in those days, if you hadn't doubled your salary uh, every two and a half years or so, uh, you were falling behind. There were all sorts of nonsense was talked about inflation being caused by the, the weather, uh, by the uh, oil shakes, uh, by trade unions and so on. And it was Milton Friedman, of course, who was brought every year by the IEA to the UK 
who taught us that inflation is always and everywhere in the long run a monetary disease. It's a disease of money. It's a monetary phenomenon. We understand that now uh, and things are very different. The second big issue, of course, were trade unions. Uh, over half the population belonged to a trade union and um, they dominated political life. Uh, they were constantly going for beer and sandwiches at number 10 and unless you, it was widely thought that unless you could uh, work closely with the unions, uh, you couldn't govern the country. Of course, today, uh, less than 20% of us uh, belong to um, a trade union, and the number of uh, days lost to strikes is, um, is nothing compared. It used to be tens of millions of days a year uh, were lost to so-called industrial action. Uh, now it's virtually nothing. And of course, related to that, the third big issue uh, was the nationalised industries, uh, the commanding heights of the economy. Uh, government owned and controlled everything, water, gas, electricity, uh, road haulage, buses, airlines, uh, 50 or 60 major companies. Uh, if, it, if the name of the company began with the word British, you probably knew it was uh, owned by the government and the service was, was terrible. Um, it, it was absolutely prehistoric. I can remember uh, setting up a new office in Russell Square around about 1979 and there was a, a three month wait for the telephone uh, and when the telephone came, you had a choice. Do you want a white one or a black one, sir? Um, and, of course, it was the unions uh, in the telephone uh, company that were keeping uh, the, the, this queue going uh, because they earned quite a lot by people like me paying, I think I had to pay £60, which in today's money would probably be about £300 uh, to jump to the head of that queue uh, to get a phone within, within a week. I mean, when you think about that, it's absolutely uh, ridiculous. And, of course, all the great... Uh, privatizations of the 80s uh, led to a huge increase in, in quality, uh, reduction in, in uh, manning levels and um, improvements all around. Andrew Marr of the BBC recently wrote that you are the most effective think tank in modern history. What do you think accounts for the IEA's success? I think two things above all. Uh, firstly, um, our sticking to our principles, uh, sticking to our guns, uh, not um, backtracking. Uh, we stress the importance of markets, uh, coupled with private property rights under the rule of law, and we don't deviate from that view that that produces a better outcome from society than any other arrangement uh, that one might be able to, to think of. And I think the second thing that's been very important throughout our history has been our independent station. Uh, if you like, we're not endowed, we have to raise our uh, budget every year, uh, but we're not allied to any trade union or particular industry or a particular party. Uh, we are generally independent. We don't uh, have a huge overarching donor who can control by weight of money. Um, we have a broad donor base across a lot of different sectors of the economy, a lot of private donors uh, who are not peddling a particular issue. And uh, I think no one company or no one industry accounts for... Uh, a significant, uh, su sufficiently significant part of our budget that they could uh, have influence on us. So I think those two things, sticking to principle and having an independent nation, have been really paramount.